and welcome. Thanks for joining our panel called Anthropology as a Crucial Frame for Change. My name is Gigi Taylor. I'm a business anthropologist working as a researcher at Indeed here in Austin, Texas. I have a background in advertising and consumer research, working previously as a consultant and as a professor. Now I would like to invite the others on my panel to introduce themselves. Patty? Hi, I'm Patty Sunderland. I'm located in New York City and I am the owner of a company called Cultural Research and Analysis. And what we do is research and strategic consulting for clients for new products, branding, communications, so on. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Arts. I'm trained as an applied anthropologist, but the work I do would mostly be considered design anthropology today. I work at the intersection of user experience, product management, and business strategy for a company by the name of Cloud Shadow Consulting, uh, where we produce digital products in a range of industries from energy to the arts for B2B and B2C. Uh, I also have a consulting company, Azimuth Labs, where I'm primarily focused on health tech and particularly consumer genetics. And I teach uh, product management at Marywood University. Hi, um, my name is Marcel Rosasalis. I'm also a cultural anthropologist and an assistant professor of marketing at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, as an anthropologist, my research and writing is centered on the longstanding relationship between the American advertising industry and the creation of um, racial ideas. Um, and I do uh, work around that as an anthropologist, as a scholar, as a professor, and also as a consultant for um, the advertising and media industries. Great, thank you everyone. I'm so glad that uh, we're all together today. Today in this session, we're going to be talking about applied cultural anthropology, specifically business anthropology, which is a discipline that helps business and technology in reframing, understanding, and interp interpreting the world crisis that we are collectively facing, not just as consumers or users, but as individuals and communities in this ever more fragile environment. Anthropology, with our core competencies of holistic, contextual, reflective, and meaning-based discipline, is well-suited to offer suggestions for structural change for business and society. So here are your three takeaways from this session. Number one, we're going to be talking about cultural analysis. We will define this and offer examples. Number two, anthropologists look at meaning and experience, experiences to help the broader frame beyond the traditional user consent, consumer product interaction. So we're gonna be talking about meaning and experiences. And number three, we're going to introduce and explain this notion of reflexivity and as we use it as a way to understand how our actions impact larger systems and institutions. Let me briefly just give you a quick backstory on how this panel got started. Back in 2019, in the before times when we had face-to-face -face South by conferences, I was invited to be on a panel called An Anthropological Approach to Reaching Consumers. I was on the panel with advertising and technology leaders. I was the only anthropologist on the panel. It was an absolutely smashing success. We were invited to present an encore session. Both our sessions filled a thousand room ballroom twice, filled to capacity with people standing outside wanting to come in. And I could see from that turnout that there was a deep desire within the South by community to learn more about applied business anthropology. So that's what this panel is about. I have invited three leading business anthropologists, cultural anthropologists to help us tell the story of anthropology. How will we run the panel? Well, rather than just one traditional moderator, we will each introduce a topic and ask others to chime in and offer thoughts. So with that, uh, Patty, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Gigi. As Gigi said, we're all cultural anthropologists, applied cultural anthropologists. And to talk about cultural analysis, you know, I think it's important to just say that within the business world, the concept that anthropology is usually associated with is ethnography. And that's a true relationship. But within anthropology, within cultural anthropology, it's really that cultural part that anthropologists are particularly obsessed with. And so now culture is a very elusive concept itself. 
But the idea that most of us here on this panel and many, many others subscribe to is what it, that is, was elucidated by Clifford Geertz in the 1970s. So um, here in the interpretation of culture in the appropriately dog-eared and used book. But what Cl Clifford Geertz was talking about was a notion of culture that was basically a symbolic or a semiotic one. In other words, that as humans, we create meanings, symbolic meanings that we then live within and through and so on. His, his metaphor was as a, a web, like a spider web that we ourselves have spun and you know, there we go about things. Now the thing is, if, if we have spun these cultural meanings ourselves, then they can also change, which is very, very important. It's not a static view. And I would just also say that, you know, since Clifford Geertz, there have been many, many people who have continued this cultural concept. So just for example, we have many theorists, the fate of culture and beyond. And just to show you a little bit more about the obsession about culture, we have culture by Renato Rizaldo. We have cultural complexity by important European anthropologists. So it's really that culture that is really our, our thing. And for anthropologists, what we sort of believe for business is that when we elucidate those symbolic meanings, that cultural realm, that that can be very helpful for creating new products, for branding concerns, for organizational issues, for whatever, perhaps to illuminate a consumption audience. Now, what's different about that culture? So the cultural analysis is elucidating those meanings. And what is very different about this approach is that much, as many of you know, much of the research and the kind of default thinking in many business worlds is one built on psychology, which basically implies it's looking at the needs, the desires, the motivations, whatever, of the individual person or persons, and then going from there to come up with the ideas. And it's also often embedded with a kind of experimental method, a notion of science versus the interpretation that this cultural analysis is really built on. And so just to give you a little slightly more concrete example of that, for example, I did a project on milk and the goal of this was to have people drink more milk. But so one of the things we looked at in that project was then how do Americans think about milk symbolically or culturally? And perhaps the image has already come up in your mind, but for most Americans, milk exists in a white glass, an iconic white glass about this big as cold. And that is what milk is. That's its iconic form. But you know, milk also exists in cereal bowls, cafe latte or cappuccino or chocolate milk, milkshakes. There's many ways in which in fact is milk. And so part of enlarging the consumption of milk was about enlarging the advertising agencies thinking about milk and then subsequently enlarging others thinking about milk. So, um, and we would argue in terms of larger social issues beyond milk, that one starts the same kind of place with cultural analysis, kind of asking what is. So you might start by asking culturally speaking, what is poverty, what is violence, what is race, and so on. So a little for a few more examples of how cultural analysis is done is work. I'm going to turn it back to Gigi. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, uh, before I, I dive into some examples, I want to share how I discovered anthropology um, as a professional. It was uh, I was working as an account planner at Hal Reine in advertising in San Francisco. Our agency had hired two anthropologists to come in and do consumer research for creative messaging. And I remember sitting in the audience, listening to their presentation, and it was literally like I was in a rocket shooting straight up in the sky with the gravitational forces pushing back my face flat as I was listening to their consumer insights that were more deep and more enduring than any psychological approach that I had been trained in. 
And it was really at that precise moment that I was hooked. I completely fell in love with anthropology. Uh, I went on to write a brief that inspired some really great advertising for the agency. And those two anthropologists were Patty Sunderland and her colleague, Rita Denny. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that moment. Since then, I've worked with Patty in other contexts. And uh, uh, we are really, truly fortunate to have Patty. She is one of the early business anthropologists to bring this method to the research community. She co-authored with, with Rita this groundbreaking book on cultural analysis. I highly recommend it. It's really um, a fabulous book on the work that we do. So Patty gave us a wonderful foundation on what is cultural analysis. Let me tell you how I apply it to my practice. So overall, I embrace the idea that consumer and user experience insights informed by anthropology can serve as the muse and inspiration for all aspects of brand design or brand strategy. I look at anthropology as like the elixir, the cauldron for empathy, creativity, and innovation. And you know, that's pretty powerful uh, that I've seen in my experience. So let me give you some specifics on how I apply this. First of all, it starts with the overall research question or the analytic frame. So of course you have to have buy-in from your stakeholders or your client. But for example, when I was working for a beauty client, my question was, what is beauty? When I was working for a home and uh, electronics client, the question is, what is household space? What is bedroom? What is technology? What is entertainment? And now for Indeed, I ask questions like, what is hiring or what is a good hire? After you set the frame like that, then you begin to write your discussion guide. So it's how the questions are asked, how the interview, ethnographic interview progresses. So for meaning, I might ask, what does beauty mean to you? And that's kind of a tough question to ask, to answer as, as, a, as a regular individual. So we use tools like collages. And here's a collage, for example, now they're digital, but Folks still do hard copy. This is a great way to get the conversation started to help people put concrete words to this abstract concept. Then I might ask to, to tap into experience. I might ask, tell me about your daily lived experience with beauty, your, your daily patterns and habits and practices around beauty. For context, I might ask, how does your beauty fit into your overall life, professional, emotional, family, life to get idea of context. And through all of this, it's not just what I'm asking, but how I'm listening and how I am observing. I'm noticing that certain beauty products live in a certain space. Other beauty product products are held with sort of care and, and love. And I listen and I ask for this. And what I'm doing is I'm listening to the stories that the people tell about themselves, trying to understand the way they organize the world. I'm constantly taking pictures. So I'll take context pictures that'll show me the larger situation, detail shots so I can see little specific minutia to their lives or action shots or videos that show process. Now, inevitably in every study, I am honestly overwhelmed. Um, I'm disoriented, especially if it's something new and different. I'm confused. I'm uncomfortable with this ambiguity and the complexity of all this. And that is simply part of the process I reflect on who I am and my part in the interpretation process. That's called reflexivity. It's, it's the idea that we ourselves as researchers, our interpreters, our part, our background and experiences inform the, our interpretation. That's why it's important to have a lot of diversity on your research team so you can come at it from different ways. So overall, I am trying to understand the customer or the user's experience how they create meaning, how do they organize, categorize, and make sense of the world. Again, this is the book to look at. And if you want to just cut to the chase, chapter two, what does cultural analysis mean? It's all right there. I have read it many times. Here it is. Here's the book. Now, honestly, there are challenges that are involved with this. One thing for me is to have my clients move from a psychological-based approach, needs, behaviors, emotions, motivations, to a cultural approach, which we're looking at symbols and meanings. Um, it involves time. And of course, this is difficult in a time in a time crunch environment. And also, if you work in a culture that is data driven, that assumes that all data is quantitative, to move and to understand that data is also qualitative, and it's meaning based. 
So those are a few of the challenges that I've felt, I've experienced. I'm sure there's others on the panel. Would someone like to add some more challenges that they've experienced? Yeah, I, I think I can jump here uh, in here. Thank you so much, Gigi, for that really insightful look into your process and the work that you do. Um, yeah, for me, I was drawn to doing the work of anthropology because, you know, I've always been a nosy person. Um, and anthropology gives you a great methodological and theoretical framework to explore that and indulge in that. Um, but also because um, anthropology really is um, a tool where we can um, really dig into the nuances of everyday human life. And in my work as a, as a researcher and as a consultant, I've, you know, addressed some of the challenges that come along with um, doing anthropology in a, in a business context through addressing some of the challenges um, that uh, marketers face in their industries. And I do this by um, using the tools of participant observation to really observe how uh, marketing and advertising professionals think about what it means to be human. Because that's a really, you know, the, the core of preoccupation of what anthropologists do is really trying to answer this question, what does it mean to be human? And so I take that question and apply it in a business context like the advertising industry to really try to understand through observing um, how marketing and advertising professionals do the work they do. How do they kind of come up with meanings about what it means to be human? And, you know, from my per, per, you know, professional experience as someone who's worked in the industry and now someone who, you know, kind of straddles uh, both worlds, um, what, you know, I've come to learn is that, that, that marketers really want to do at the very least is understand human beings so they, you know, can anticipate, predict, and ultimately shape our perceptions and, act, and actions towards a product or a brand, et cetera. And so, of course, consumer research is, is one way that, that marketers really try to um, manage and, and mitigate the, the, the risks, but also the inevitable unpredictabilities that come along with us human beings, right? And so through, through research, through the work of research, if a, if a target segment is made knowable and you know, seemingly fully understandable at the outset, there seems to be this feeling, this sense of assuredness that we have rationalized um, and kind of under, come up with a, with a neat understanding of what it means to be, to be a person in a, in a particular like marketplace context. But you know, a challenge that comes along with this cultural practice that is so um, part and parcel to, to, to marketing as a field, it's a knowledge creation process where markets are made. They're not, you know, they're, they're not found. And in that respect, um, inevitably involve uh, marketers to, to create, to construct categories um, where ideas about social difference, such as um, race and ethnicity, uh, become the frameworks through which um, markets are made, but at the same time can be bound up with underlying theories that actually work to oversimplify and obscure the, the wide ranges of divergences and diversities that exist within groups that are classified as, you know, supposedly the same, right? And so um, I'll give an example of, of work that I did um, consulting at a media agency where I was uh, asked to um, give a workshop about you know, how this, these um, media planners could use you know, the tools of cultural analysis um, that, that Patty and Gigi so eloquently explained um, to you know, flesh out their, their methods for audience research. And so the, the agency had developed a, a consumer segmentation framework, an audience segmentation framework um, for US Hispanic um, consumers. And they created this, this framework that they use with clients to try to you know, get them interested in, in, in buying Hispanic media and targeting US Hispanic consumers. And their, their framework uh, included um, a sort of a, a, a scale where they classified um, U.S. Hispanics into you know, a, a select couple of types of people. And the scale went from the most American to the least American. And these groups were accompanied by photos um, and descriptions where the most American Hispanic was a blonde haired blue eyed person. The least acculturated Hispanic was a brown skinned dark haired person and had a bunch of behaviors and traits associated to them um, that on their face were, were, were quite stereotypical and were, were steeped in these type of racial ideas, these longstanding racial ideas about what we, what comes to mind when we think of the average American, right? And so it, 
in, completely invisible from this framework were the immense you know, racial and ethnic diversity that exists within the Hispanic pan-ethnic category. So in my workshop, I really wanted to challenge these media planners to, to think critically about this tool that they had created, that they were using. And how I did this um, was to offer them you know, a history of how this Hispanic US census category was invented, which is quite recently. It only got onto the US census in 1980. And it's a concept that we take for granted, or at least me as someone who would be classified in this category as something that's always existed, right? But through, you know, giving these professionals the opportunity to really sit with, you know, the role that history and politics plays in these tools that they create, I encourage them to do something that anthropologists really love to do, which is making the familiar strange. It's really taking those ideas and rituals that we take for granted as just being normal and picking them apart really unpacking them, treating them as a specimen, perhaps like a, like a scientist would, um, and getting them to really actually get this, take the segmentation, mark it up, write out their observations and reflections on it. And it was through that exercise, quite simple exercise, that the, the media planners were quite dismayed by the, the implicit you know, racial biases that were so prevalent in the framework that they were using with their clients every single day. And so it was after just that, you know, couple of hours of time where we, we, we addressed the challenge that these, these planners never even considered being a challenge and got the agency to actually change their, their segmentation framework entirely. And so I, I bring up this example just to talk about how the tools of anthropology can, can reveal so much and can offer so much, um, you know, through the use of in-depth cultural analysis we can really help businesses gain insight into you know, uh, their involvement in social issues that they may have not even perceived playing a role in. And so that's what I think really the, the, the magic of culture anthropology is for business is to offer a lens and framework for people to see their business in a new way, the work they do in a new way, and also be able to situate themselves into the larger uh, political and, and social dynamics that they may not, not have even conceived being connected to in the first place. Thanks, Marcel. I mean, something that that all brings up really is also ethics, right? And so we have a few ethical obligations. One is certainly to our participants, and that's really first. Um, but sort of related to that is the ethical obligation to really not partake in the development of products, or services or you know, even brands, if you will, that may cause harm. And sometimes we get in sticky situations where we really need to navigate that and it's challenging and it doesn't always work out. Sometimes we may even have to walk away from a project that potentially we were really excited about, but you know, the circumstances may uh, just be so that we can't actually convince say like the project sponsor to uh, do the right thing, if you will, to do no harm. Um, we also have to contend with you know, other issues, ethical issues such as privacy. In my own work, when I study consumer genetics, you know, not only am I studying uh, something that is one of the most personal aspects of, you know, of a human, right, their, their genome, but you're also talking about potential disease susceptibility, or if they already have, you know, uh, a disease, you know, potential, you know, what they may have today, and, and what they might do about that as a result of this newfound sort of information that they've gotten. And so it raises a lot of questions just of what is our role in that? And, you know, how do we navigate all of those uh, situations? And also to your point, I think that's really interesting about, um, you know, on the identity piece, they even again, with my own work in genetics, Genetics is um, consumer genetic tests are potentially, you know, implicated in racial thinking, right? You know, people are sort of being told that they are this identity or that this race, and you know, what does that really mean for the long term perspective of how we view race? Is it sort of reinforcing those um, problems? And furthermore, you know, in in this space, like. You know, I'm particularly interested in bio data. What does it mean to exchange your data with a company that's monetizing it uh, for? You know, based on a premise that in the future you're going to get some value, right? Is that fair? Should we contribute to that? Should we be helping uh, clients like this convince through advertising customers that they will get value? You know, so those are those are some ethical things that we need to work through, and they're challenging. There's no easy answers. Sometimes we try to change it, and we can, as I say, and so sometimes we walk away. But I think in the end, 
it's always about doing the right thing for our participants. Uh, it all comes back to that. And that's really what grounds us and helps me get through those challenges. Another thing you, you more or less were alluding to, or that was baked into all that you're saying is our critical perspective. And I'd like to maybe just bring that up because it's, you know, we are very uh, adept at really analyzing and taking that critical perspective given our history. And that's very important. And we need to keep doing that. We will keep doing that, but it's also sort of not our only orientation. We are also really thinking to the future these days, not just sort of analyzing the past. You know, we're very much concerned with change and, and what our role is in creating that change. And so you know, I'll relate that to the work that I do. So I work in user experience, which you know, I bring up because uh, it's quite hot, right? A lot of anthropologists are going to work in that, but of course, a lot of companies are also hiring for UX roles because we're all starting to build digital products. And so, you know, anthropologists are really uh, fit for this particular role. And, you know, I want to explain why, but I also want to maybe touch on what UX is not, because I also think it's important for anybody that's listening to maybe hear some of this. So, you know, it's not just making interfaces pretty or simply studying like, you know, the interface itself or even how we interact with that. It's really much more than the interaction with just an interface. Now, the user experience is really the totality of, of a human's experience with a product, a service, or a brand. And to that end, you know, we have to go beyond just that simple interaction. We really need to understand the context of use as everybody has talked about so far. Understanding how something like a, tech, you know, a technology product is used in the environment, how it, you know, it's matured or, or uh, sort of embodied in that culture and, and changes from you know, the use within that culture and even how it is sort of impacts it, you know, the development of that culture is all really important because as we know, from a long history of study in anthropology, all humans pretty much everywhere adapt technologies, not just information technologies, but technology in general to the local context. And so we always need to get in context. And that brings up ethnography, which Patty mentioned in the beginning. So, you know, as Marcel was saying, uh, anthropology is really the study of humanity, the human experience. Some people confuse that with anthropology, but they are different. And ethnography is the method by which we go about making sense of culture, or maybe you might even say like a collection of methods. So, you know, observation, participant observation, as Marcel mentioned, interviewing or question asking, uh, and, you know, other methods as well. We also do use quantitative and get into mixed methods research as anthropologists. But it, in the end, it really all comes back to our process of using those methods and then documenting through text, video, photo, audio, and ultimately analyzing with social theory. The social theory is really what supercharges all of the work that we do. And I point this out because ethnog uh, you know, ethnography is very hot. People are doing it everywhere. It's kind of all the rage these days, but not everybody does it the same. And I'm not making an argument for one discipline or the other. I'm really making an argument for like quick research without social theory sort of supporting it versus this sort of more supercharged way that really gives us the explanatory power that creates great brands, great products, and great services. And so it's worth pointing out that, you know, we are very proud of ethnography and the history of ethnography, but also that ethnography is changing. It's no longer like, you know, the lone researcher just going out into some distant place for a year and sort of you know, studying some other culture, documenting it as if they were sort of the expert on that culture instead of the actual people who you know, are, are embedded in that web, as Patty mentioned. And so, you know, in the modern sense, we are really working like across time and space, often much more rapid, at least many of us on this, you know, here today work much more rapid since we work in business. We collaborate with lots of stakeholders, other disciplines, some of which use ethnography and have contributed to its evolution in a, you know, in a quite positive way. And most importantly, the participants. So we co-create with participants, you know, participatory research, participatory design. We use our participants, not use them, but we work with them to, you know, sort of bring in their knowledge to really let them shine, be the experts. You know, we give them the voice because ultimately they know best. And it's just, we're there to almost facilitate, if you will, in some sense. And so that idea of facilitation maybe speaks a little bit to like, you know, what's next for us. And, or at least for me as a design anthropologist, much of the work becomes really about the future. 
It's not to say that I'm not going to keep working on products that exist and trying to improve those. But for me, it's really about, you know, what is next? What are the possibilities? Where are we going with all this? It's not just, you know, about, uh, you know, looking back and trying to understand it. It's about creating change, solving wicked problems. And that's what really excites me. And so one example, maybe just to wrap this up, I'm currently working on a project in the art space. And if anybody knows anything about the art market, full of structural issues. You know, we have access, there's issues of access, you know, diversity and inclusion, relationships are often strained. And so to the point of like Gigi and, you know, Patty earlier, went and asked questions about, you know, what is a relationship or what is a good relationship? You know, why do you struggle to break into this market? You know, what, what would a good collaboration look like between you and a business partner? And with, by asking those kind of questions, we are now digitizing, um, you know, creating a new solution that we'll not just recreate offline problems. You know, and, you know, today in a lot of the innovation in this space is really just in, in tech in general is really just about taking offline problems, digitizing them, and bringing them online and potentially amplifying them. We're not trying to do that. You know, we want to create new possibilities by letting the participants design the solution based on the the possibilities and you know, sort of the imaginaries in, in their own world and how they see their experience. So um, with that all said, you know, maybe, or so I know you're also working on a lot of other pressing kind of wicked problems. You want to maybe pick up from there? Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing again, insight into the dynamic work that you do. Uh, you made a point about, you know, um, the focus on, you know, the future and looking ahead to how products and services can be created to, to meet the needs of, yeah, a quickly of, of approaching future. And, and I think that at least in, in, in my work, um, what has been a, a crucial for me as a, as a researcher and also as someone who consults in industry is really getting um, folks in, in marketing in particular to understand um, their industry's role in history. Um, and taking that time to be ref reflexive about the role that um, marketing and advertising has played in shaping, um, you know, social forces that we may have not conceived of, of marketing having a stake in before. Um, you know, a core premise of, of my work is that, I mean, I would, you know, venture to say cultural analysis in general, um, is that business doesn't, you know, take place in a, in a void, in a cultural vacuum, but it's embedded and shaped by the contours of history and the politics of our social world or, and our many um, dynamic contexts that we exist in. And so, you know, one of the one of the domains that I think we can witness um, the effect of, of politics on business um, in the in the past, in the present, and in the future, is in how uh, again advertisers think about uh, their consumers as human beings, and 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 principally looking at that through the process of of consumer segmentation. You know, this is a seemingly you know rational and objective process, right? A company's trying to find you know the most most lucrative, the most valuable segment of the human population for their products. But what I've continued to find in my work is that these decisions are influenced by pervading cultural ideas about you know, which people in our society are, are valuable and who is not, uh, which groups of people are perceived as you know, worthy of certain products or, or services. Uh, we can see how that plays out in a you know, variety of sectors um, from consumer packaged goods to you know, assets like, like home ownership. And so in the, in the US in particular, we can see how um, a longstanding history and an ongoing uh, presence of, of, of racial divisions has, has really impacted the practice and the cultural rituals, as if you will, of, of consumer segmentation as it's practiced by, by, by brand marketers and at people who work in advertising. You know, Patty brought up this question, you know, what is race, right? And how an anthropologist would kind of come at these questions with, you know, come at this issue by asking that, that, that really big and important question. And I can answer that by saying that race is an invented political concept that was designed, you know, quite recently in our, our history as a species to, to organize and rank people based on flawed overgeneralizations about human biology, behavior, and also, you know, social, you know, social belonging as well. 
And so in my work, I, I look at how the history of racism in America has really been, can be layered onto the history of, of advertising. And what we see is the outcomes of, of, of racism and practices like racial segregation um, shaping um, how companies um, conceive of their target consumers. We see how these deep social divisions created by you know, political practices and, and, and legal edicts and the like have been transplanted onto um, how marketers do business, where the very notion of you know, the average American consumer has been you know, envisioned by, by companies and in market research that, um, that this consumer is you know, a white person um, and, a, and a white person who is this aspirational American norm, this American average that is a, is a bundle of racial ideas that, that not only play out in, in marketing and advertising, but also play out in the enduring political battles over citizen, citizenship rights and, and immigration that we continue to see um, play out today. And so these are profoundly political ideas that one may not necessarily think have anything to do with business, but in my work I found have profoundly shaped and continue to shape the advertising business and how it's structured. Um, for you know, one example of this is um, you know, in, the, in the wake of the up social justice uprisings that have occurred um, in, the, in the summer due to the you know, uh, police murders of you know, too many um, African-Americans to count at this point, um, we see that there's been, a, a, again, another reckoning in the advertising industry with dealing with the, the reality of racially exclusionary practices in hiring and career advancement that have you know, led to an entrenching of a particular vision of the marketplace, um, one that is divided into a general market uh, of assumed you know, white consumers, a white America, and a multicultural market uh, where you have agencies, consultancies, and a whole you know, industry sector that serves you know, everyone else. And, and so in my work as an anthropologist and consultant, I'm studying how the industry right now is, is reckoning with its past, where it's gotten them in the present, and also how um, reckoning with this present can lead the industry into hopefully a, a new future. And I've been doing this by really mobilizing cultural anthropology and also cultural analysis to understand how uh, marketers participate in creating racial ideas and how brands also um, you know, reproduce these ideas and how they think about their consumers. And so this is what my, my work is really centered on is using history, um, historical analysis and cultural analysis to, to bring to the marketing and advertising industry um, to really address this, this, moral, this moral, political, and economic crisis that is racism and how it manifests in marketing. Um, you know, a tall order, right? Such an enduring centuries long, long problem, but something that I think that um, anthropology as a tool is, is well suited to, to contribute to, um, to, to changing in the business world. And so with all that said, you know, I'm super curious to hear from, from anyone who's interested in kind of uh, piggybacking on this. Um, I guess in the work that you all do, how has um, and how have you used anthropology and how you work with your clients? And how has that, um, how has your use of anthropology helped you reframe, I guess, your client's understanding of, of big social problems? And then along with that, <laughs> what lessons have you learned along the way by, you know, helping your clients um, address big social problems in, the, in their industries? Uh, I'll jump in and piggyback on that. First of all, just with the a very concrete piggyback. Marcel was talking about the problems of the general market versus the multicultural market. And there was, uh, Rita, Denny and I have written about this actually in that book that Gigi showed at the beginning of this, where in a, for a company, they actually defined the general market included white people as well as African-American people whose income got up to a certain level. Then African-Americans magically joined the general market where all the white people were, right? White low income people were not in some special category. And otherwise, if you were African-American and of a lower income, then you belong to the African-American market. And I don't think that we need to think 
very long to realize what this does then in terms of defining who is African-American in the US, a continual recreation of a number of stereotypes. So I would say that's where we brought our critical anthropology lens to try to problematize that. We have also, as Marcel was talking about, done studies where, and in fact, this was a study that we worked with Gigi on, where there was wanting to look at Hispanic consumers. And there was a lot of discussion about what was the, between the acculturated and the assimilated and all these categories. And a lot of it went down to language. And so if you only spoke English or if you only spoke Spanish and, or if you spoke both and be kind of one-to-one -one correspondence, when people's lives are much more difficult and, and much more complicated and people can be going back and cross on the border if um, and back and cross in language use. And there's not a, you know, trying to use anthropology theory of looking at languages to say all culture is not necessarily in the language you use. So maybe I'm getting in too complicated grounds here, but I wanted to bring another example, just an international example that perhaps clear some things up. It's, it's not exactly a wicked social problem, but you could think it was. And I want to go to New Zealand, where you know, Matt was also talking about working with other experts. And there, our other experts were really the people who worked in the ad agency. And we worked with ad agency from New Zealand, as well as a branch of that ad agency from Australia. And we were trying to study New Zealand identity, Australian identity and trans-Tasman identity across the Chas Tasman Sea for both countries. And it was, was very important because many international companies would come and sort of say to the New Zealanders, no, just use the ads we create in Australia. You know, Australia is the larger country. Australia is considered the more important market. So just use those ads. So the New Zealand agency wanted to make clear how different and how unique and how special New Zealand was. Now, one could argue, of course, this is a way of having business for New Zealand, but it is also the creation of national identity and identity for the people who live in New Zealand. And New Zealand is a very different place than Australia. It wasn't actually accurate to be using the same advertising materials. So that's the way we're, Anthropologists work and anthropologists perspective together with the planners really work to help create a notion of New Zealand identity for the, the people in New Zealand and for the agency, this won great awards, the sort of myths of New Zealandness and ideas of New Zealandness, they really carried it through. And later we also worked on a study for social marketing messaging. So social marketing messaging in New Zealand and to really look at sort of the tropes and ideas of New Zealand and the sort of good and bad tropes that were recreated in much of the social marketing messaging. Many of them were stereotypes that as Marcel was saying, if they're not examined and looked at and looked at the history of, then one can just keep repeating unfortunate things. So I think I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Patty. Thank you very much, Marcel, Matt. Really appreciate your insights and explanation of what is cultural anthropology and how we can apply them to uh, big and small problems. Uh, in closing, what I'd like to do now is invite each of the panelists to share a very, very brief closing thought, an idea that you'd like to leave our audience with. So uh, Patty, can you start us off? Sure. I really think that the value of anthropology within business as well as dealing with social problems is that anthropology can really give us a new and different frame for looking at things that we don't usually use. And that framework can be really good for getting us out of stuck places. And I'd like to say that, you know, I know many people listening may have the, the vision of you know, somebody in khakis digging up dinosaur bones, right? And we are, anthropology as a discipline is so much more than that. And, you know, those of us on this session who are applied anthropologists, you know, who are working in business, do very different work. 
all of the work of anthropology is important, but we in the business space are, you know, excellent collaborators. We are really poised to, to help all organizations out there work through these kind of problems. And it's not the old anthropology of the past only, right? We are this anthropology of the future. We are here to help and we have a lot to contribute. Um, and I'll just build on that by saying, you know, our, our biases are only unconscious when we don't, you know, make the time and effort to self-reflect on our take it for granted practices and ideas. And uh, that is especially true in business and can be um, a block to, to innovation and social change. And so anthropology is really a vital tool, I think, and I think my fellow panelists can agree, um, for unlocking our understanding of our ritual practices, and which can ultimately be a depth of understanding that will be a vital way for reframing the role of, of business in, in making change. And I will close with this, this very simple thought. Hire anthropologists. You've heard us call ourselves either cultural anthropologists, business anthropologists, design anthropologists, consumer anthropologists, organizational anthropologists, We're, but we all work on the umbrella of business anthropology, applied cultural anthropologists. Hire us as internal research partners to complement your existing research practice, UX practice, or as external partners, consultants, vendors, to help you tackle those very wicked problems that exist. And thank you for joining us today. And I hope you can see how anthropology can be really be a crucial for change. Thank you.